and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. Look at your neighbor, tell get ready for the third day. What happened on the third day? The third day is the day that he resurrected. The third day is the day that he revealed himself to the world as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Even in Exodus, he was telling them, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. I'm trying to get my TD Jakes on and y'all ain't helping right now. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Skip to verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it. You see all this, all this smoke and all this other kind of stuff that we have here, it's biblical. It is the presence, the Shekinah glory. <laughs> because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. You guys ever been driving like through Baltimore City or whatever maybe and you see one of those warehouses that there's just like the constant billow of smoke coming out of that smokestack? That's what Mount Sinai looked like when Jesus, when God came and rested upon it. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked. Is this amazing how much this sounds like Resurrection Sunday? that literally when that stone was rolled away, it said that an earthquake shook and the mountains were shaking. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by, and no still small voice, ain't no cloud, ain't no fire, God spoke to Moses. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. It, all of that and he ain't even arrived yet. <laughs> Sheesh. It says, he came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses, let's go up. <laughs> Father God, we're grateful. God, that there is power in your name. The name of Jesus is where we find freedom. The name of Jesus is where we find hope. The name of Jesus is where we find joy. The name of Jesus is where we find purpose. God, we've come today for that one reason, to lift up your name and to encounter you. God, we're not gonna pretend or act like we know what is about to happen. We're not gonna pretend and act like we know what you're about to say. Because God, you said that you are doing a new thing and we are locked in anxious anticipation for what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has to say to us. God, our ears are focused, our heart attuned. Speak to us, we pray, in my name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Before you sit down, if you can high five three people, tell them it's all about the presence. It's all about the presence. It's hallelujah. We are concluding a series that we started about four weeks ago called Made in the Wild. Can somebody say Made in the Wild? And it's always amazing to me when I... Um, start a series after, um, you may not know this, but a lot of times when I preach a series, it's three, four months in the crock pot, just kind of cooking and festering and marinating. How many people know if you eat a meal before it's done, it doesn't taste quite right. It has to let the seasoning soak in and all that other good stuff. And oftentimes, that's what a message is like. I've already planned out January series and February series and March series, and they're just sitting in a Holy Ghost crock pot, just taking in all that jerk seasoning and all that Caribbean flavor. So when it comes out, it's just right. It's just, just so good. But this series in particular has kind of taken on a life of its own. So many people come to me after and say, man, that message is exactly what I needed to hear. What you may not know is oftentimes when I'm preaching, there's only one person in the room, that's me and God, and he's preaching to me and you're just eavesdropping on a conversation that we're having. And I hope you've been blessed by this series, but even if you haven't, and I know that you have, this has blessed me because it's brought so much clarity to seasons in life. What I've discovered is that so often you'll find yourself in a season that you don't understand. 
and you'll feel discouraged, you'll feel depressed, and you'll feel hopeless. Not because you're in the wrong place, but because you simply don't understand the place where you are. And without vision, the Bible says that people cast off restraint. I'd like to submit to you that chances are the worry or the anxiety or the fear that you experience is not that you're in a precarious situation. It's just that you have not yet received vision for what God is doing in your life in this season. But let me encourage you, he is never off the job, even if it doesn't make sense, even if you don't understand it, even if you're not quite sure what's next or where he is taking you, you need to know by faith that your steps are ordered by God, that he is in control, that he has not forgotten you, that he has not forsaken you, that he has greater things ahead of you than behind you. Somebody say amen like it's 10 o'clock up in this place. What we've been talking about is that in-between season of life where you're not where you used to be, but you're not quite where you want to be. We're, we're mapping the journey of Israel as God brought them out of bondage in Egypt, and he was taking them to the promised land, but he said, I can't take you the fast way. How many people, just a show of hand, just make your pastor feel like he's not the only person in this church that has issues. How many people you like to get where you need to go as quickly as you possibly can? No detours, no scenic route, no sidetracks. God bless you just to know that I'm in a place of comrades, of brothers and sisters. You get it. You get off in the HOV lane just to get around the traffic and to get right back on the highway that you just got off on, but you have no intention of sitting in waiting if you don't have to. Well, I've discovered that God doesn't always take the fast lane. God's the type of person that will have four people in his car and he still won't go in the HOV lane. Because there's something that he's trying to teach us along the way and along that journey. And he knows that if we don't learn those wilderness lessons, when we step into the promised land, it will only be a visit, not a possession. And God says, I'm not setting you up to visit hope. I'm not setting you up to visit peace. I'm not setting you up to visit fulfillment. I'm setting you up to abide there, to live there. The Bible says you're going to sleep in beds that you did not make. You're going to reap harvests that you did not sow. God said, I'm trying to set you up to stay there, not just to visit there. God, why haven't you blessed me financially yet? Because if I bless you now, you're gonna end up in the same situation you are now five years from now. But if I can teach you the lessons that you need to know so that you can stay debt free once you get debt free and that you can learn to live on less than you make when you actually have it. You can learn to budget, you can learn to invest. So it's not, it's not gonna be, remember that one year when I got that really big bonus? But it's going to be, man, I can't remember the last time that I did not have more than enough. Even if you don't like it, somebody say amen. It's in the wilderness that he teaches us to follow his presence and not our feelings. It's in the wilderness where God teaches us to recognize his approval, even though there's adversity around us. You got to understand, just because everything's not perfect doesn't mean you're not smack dab in the middle of will of God. Sometimes the worse it gets, the better positioned you are. It's because the enemy is afraid of where you are, and he's trying to discourage you and get you to turn back. Last week we learned that it's in the wilderness where man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. God bless DC, God bless New York Stock Exchange, God bless Silicon Valley, God bless our agriculture, but they are not my providers. My provider is Jehovah Jireh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and his stock never goes down. He never drops. He's never concerned about what the employment rate is. This quarter, last quarter, the quarter before, because he said, I did not come to pick sides, but I came to take over. It's so important not to skip those transition seasons because it's in those transition seasons that you pick up the skill set to possess and to maintain that which God has for you. One of the most integral transition seasons of every single person's life is between 14 and 21. That teenage, young adulthood season is, is when you're, you're, you're too young or you're too old to be a kid, but you're too young to be an adult. 
You're at the point, I was talking to somebody who had a 14 year old and they said, man, my kid can't wait to begin to go out and hang out with their friends. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? You're 14, you can finally babysit your brothers and sisters. You ain't going nowhere. Every Friday night, you will be here. I've been waiting for a free babysitter my entire life. You're a little bit too old to be a kid but you're too young to be an adult. And listen to me, if you have teenagers in this place or if you are a teenager, the enemy's goal is to get you to waste those seasons of your life to waste them stressed out about what college you're gonna get into, to waste them stressed out about who you're gonna date in middle school. Can I tell you who you are dating in middle school or high school? 99 out of 99 times, you will not marry that joker. They will be a loser by freshman year in college, so just forget them now. The enemy's trying to waste your time on 2K and Madden and Fortnite and all these other kind of stuff. And listen to me, there's nothing wrong with those things except their distractions. And now you're 22 and you don't know how to recognize the presence of God. Now you're 24, 25 and you don't know that God's your provider, not your student loans. And what happens is we're learning things and I don't know about you, but I feel discouraged when I hear about stuff I should have learned back then and I didn't. And God is able to accelerate the learning process. But I'm talking particularly to teenagers or parents of teenagers. Do not allow the enemy to waste your child's time on things that are not gonna set them up, not to be a good kid. You know we're not raising good kids. Our goal is to raise mature adults. Because if we raise good kids, they'll be good 40-year-old kids. (laughs) That, That was never the goal. Quick commercial break, student night is tonight at 6 p.m. If you have a middle schooler, if you have a high schooler, get them in this building. So God finds a man by the name of Moses, and he said, Moses, the nation of Israel, they're crying out to me, and I need you to go. But you may not know is that Moses was actually a Jew. Moses was born in Egypt. He was born in bondage. He was born the same time when Pharaoh said, the Jewish people are becoming too numerous. Let me kill off all the two-year-old boys and under. But Moses was saved because he was placed in a basket by his mother and placed in the Nile River. And the Nile River took him actually to the palace of Pharaoh where Pharaoh's daughter found him and raised her as her own. If I had more time to preach, I would teach you how if you place your child, if you place your life, if you place your dreams, not in the Nile River, but in the river of God, in the presence of God, if you would trust him with your dreams instead of yourself, he will ensure that they were protected and taken to a place where they will thrive. Moses, being a Jew, grew up in Pharaoh's palace, was educated in the Egyptian schools, was educated in the art of war and and royalty and all those other kind of stuff. The only problem is Moses never fit in because he was too Jewish to be Egyptian, but he was too Egyptian to be Jewish. He was Jewish, and yet he related with the Jewish people and their pain and their struggle. The only problem is he had never actually experienced that pain and experienced that struggle because he was raised with privilege. He was raised in the palace. He was raised in a place where he was being prepared to be a deliverer, not a follower. I've discovered so many of us, we feel like we don't fit in. Some of you are getting ready for Thanksgiving dinner, and you're going to sit around a table with people that you share a last name with but that's about all you share in common with them. You, 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 you just feel like a foreigner at your own table because you don't think the same, you don't talk the same, you don't have the same goals, you don't have the same aspirations, you, your, your lives are kind of heading in the opposite direction and you may be feeling, man, I feel isolated, I feel like I don't fit in, I feel like I am kind of an oddball. What you have to understand is like Moses, the reason why he did not fit in is because he was never meant to be one of the crowd, he was never meant to be one of the people, he was always ordained by God from day one to lead those that he came from into a promise that they had never experienced. So watch this. You know the story, Moses kills an Egyptian because he had a little anger issue that he actually never dealt with. So to save his life, he ran out into the wilderness and lived there for 40 years. Before Israel ever wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, Moses had lived there prior for 40 years. What they called the wilderness, Moses called home. 
And what I've discovered is those seasons of my life where I feel like God is holding me back, those seasons of life that are often the most frustrating are actually God's school of leadership because he's setting me up to be able to lead other people through those exact same seasons. And when they're afraid and when they're fearful and when they're concerned, Moses was able to say, oh, that bear, I've known that bear for years. Oh, that lion, he has no teeth. I'm telling you, I've lived out here my whole life life. The wilderness is not as scary as it looks. I've been there. There needs some people that have been through the wilderness in their marriage and have survived that can take their hand and put it over some young couple and say, hey, don't you worry. You did not marry the wrong person. Even if the enemy is whispering that in your air, I've been there and I'll tell you how you can get through this experience safely. It was in the wilderness that we find this in Exodus chapter three, verse four, it says this. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. If you remember, there was a bush that was on fire and Moses went to look at the bush and the bush started talking to him. I don't care if you're atheist or agnostic or you just don't believe in God or you believe in every single God there is. When a bush starts talking to you, oh, you're gonna stop and look. And the bush said, he didn't even say God said, he said the bush said, it's not like a Disney movie. I'm thinking about, what, what is that, uh, Beauty and the Beast with a little light, candle light starts talking or whatever. So the bush said, Moses, Moses. If you remember growing up when you were in trouble and your mama called you by your government name, Stephen Rodney Chandler. When God says your name twice in the Bible, it's as if he called you by your government name. Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come any closer. Take off your Yeezys. <laughs> for the place where you are standing is holy ground. There is a place in God where you're not allowed to bring all the disappointments that you've walked through. There is a place in God where you're not allowed to bring all the regrets and all the bitterness and all the why couldn't you. God said to Moses, you can't bring into my presence everything that you've walked through. You have to understand in my presence is fullness of joy, in my presence is holiness. This is a sacred place and I need you to drop off all those things you've been carrying before you come any further. He said, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Listen to me, it was in the darkest season of Moses' life, it was in the wilderness where he had an encounter with the presence of God. And Moses spent the rest of his life trying to lead an entire nation to the exact encounter that he had had with God. If you're taking notes, write this down. The whole point is his presence. The whole point of the wilderness was to get Israel to encounter the presence of God. The whole reason why God did not take them the fast way, the whole reason why God says, I'm going to take you on a roundabout way, the whole reason why God slowed their journey is because he wanted them to encounter him. The Bible teaches us that Israel was in slavery for over 400 years, which means every single person that came out of Egypt was born in Egypt. They were born in slavery and they were born in their situation of bondage. Not only were they born in slavery and they were born in bondage, they were born in Egypt. And if you don't know about Egypt, they believed in multiple gods. God of love, God of the Nile, God of the river, God of fertility, God of this, God of that, Ra, Newt, Batut, all those other gods. Anybody saw King of Egypt, you know the song. I got like three, <laughs> three out of them. I did some research and I discovered that there were over 2,000 recognized gods in Egypt. And Israel had never encountered the true God. They had only heard stories about the God of their father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And listen to me, God refused to fight with two other thousand voices that were drawing for the attention of Israel. He said, no, I'm going to bring you out to a place where there is nothing else competing for your attention except for me. 
I've discovered sometimes when it feels like my life has come to a halt, when it feels like I'm not where I want to be, I'm just stuck. It's because God is trying to get my attention and he is tired competing with other things that are challenging for the voice and for the time of God. God's tired of competing with your boyfriend or your girlfriend for your attention. God's tired of competing with your career, with your goals, with your aspirations, with your dreams for your attention. God is tired of competing with your 401k, your 403b, your Roth IRA, your SEP account, any other requirement accounts I haven't hit yet. God says, listen to me, there are so many gods here on earth that are vying for your attention, and I am a jealous God. What does that mean? There is nobody else on my level, and I will not share my glory with anybody else, so I will take you to a place where you can understand that I'm the one that you need. So if you find yourself in an in-between season, if you find yourself where you're not quite where you want to be, you're not where you used to be, you're just stuck, listen to me, it's because God wants your attention. It's because God is trying to get you to fall in love with his presence like never before. He said, Moses, come up here, come up here, come up here. And then he said, hey, go tell the people this is what I want from them. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, he said this, this is what I want Israel to be, and you shall be my kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God says you're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Can I, can I, can I read one more verse, and then I'm going to scream, and if you don't scream, I'm going to be concerned. <laughs> so I'll just set you up to scream. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. I appreciate that scream. So watch this. You, 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 hopefully you've heard that verse before, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You're a holy priesthood, a royal generation. That was never meant for us. We were never supposed to be God's holy people in a chosen generation. It always was supposed to be Israel. God brought them out into the wilderness to encounter him, just like Moses encountered him at the bush. God told Moses, go tell the people, who I want them to be my holy people, a chosen generation. And guess what the people said? We don't want to be. No, we, 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 we want to be like everybody else. We don't want to be God's, and because they rejected it, God said, when I make a promise, it will come to pass. If they don't want it, go find me some Gentiles. Go find me some people who used to be rejected and let them know, I want you now to be a holy people, a chosen generation set apart by God. It always was God's intention that you, that somebody would be his special people. Why does God have you stuck? Can I preach for a second? You are stuck because you don't know how special you are. You are stuck because you don't know that you are royalty. You don't know that you come from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You don't know that you are a priest unto God. And God says, I cannot let you go one step further until you understand who you are. Because if you continue on thinking that you're a commoner, thinking that there's nothing special about you, thinking that you're average, you will forfeit the promise that I have for you. There is a difference when you walk into a room knowing who you are in that room than in questioning, will they think I am somebody in this room? God says, I am tired of my people wondering who they are. And I will hold them in a holding pattern until they figure out you're not like them. You, are, you can't talk like that. You can't be discouraged like that. You can't speak words of hopelessness. You can't speak words of discouragement. You can't speak words of doom and division and all that other kind of stuff because you're not one of them. You belong to me and we are royalty. Can you imagine if President Trump's son or President Obama's daughters or the Bush daughters or whoever the president's kids were over the last multiple decades. Could you imagine if you saw them at Kmart just walking up and down the aisles by themselves? 
I would be concerned, you would be concerned, we would all be concerned because the president's children are out here acting normal and they're not normal and this is dangerous. God is just as concerned when you walk up and down the aisles of Kmart, forgive me, Kmart doesn't exist anymore, but Target or Walmart or whatever it is, as if you were normal. Angels are concerned, demons are trembling because they said they act in normal, they think they're average, they don't understand, they were set apart by God. Somebody shout, I'm not normal. Now somebody whisper, I knew you weren't normal. Seriously, you're not normal. I, I don't know why God won't let me get by this point. You're not average. You're, We have to be so careful that we don't pick up American cultures and cultures of, 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 of our background and our heritage when, when those cultures and some of those mindsets aren't biblical. There's this American mindset of, I need to make something of myself. You do not need to make something of yourself because before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you and called you as a prophet to the nation. He ordered your steps. I'm not making anything of myself. I'm stepping in the direction of God because every footprint that I make has been ordered by God. I'm not making this up by chance. This is not, let's see what becomes of Stephen or Jason, or whatever your name is. This is, he know, sit down. Old school monarchy, right? Even in England right now, when there's a king or a queen and their firstborn son is automatically the prince, he never wonders what his vocation will be. He's never worried about his future. He's worried about his brother killing him, so then his future is all. But other than that, he's not worried about his future because his future was defined in his birth. I was born the firstborn of the king, which makes me the next king. Stop worrying about your future. Your future was defined the day you were born again into the kingdom of God. He said, because you belong to me, you are royalty. So go ahead, go into army so you can be a good king. And go ahead and get you a stupid degree as if you need it and all these other things that monarchies do to buy their time before they step into whatever they were born into. You have to understand that I am set apart by God. The second thing I need you to write down is this. If we skip his presence, we'll forfeit his promise. If we skip his presence, we will forfeit his promise. God said, get the entire nation together. Moses, bring them up to me. Watch this. The place where God wanted to meet all of Israel, the place where his presence descended upon that mountain, the place where it shook and there were trumpets and there was smoke, is the exact mountain where Moses encountered that burning bush. This is the place of my presence. Some translations call it Mount Sinai. Some translations call it Mount Horeb. Those words are interchangeable. It's the same mountain. God told Moses, come lead my people into the place where I first encountered you. By the way, that's what it means to be a spiritual leader. Husbands, fathers, it's our job to lead our children and our wives to a place in God where we have already been. You can't lead people to a place that you haven't first been yourself because you don't know how to get there. Moses came up and said, go tell the people, man, I'm gonna call each and every one of them by name. I'm gonna speak to them, bring them up here. And look what Israel said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunders, the lightnings and the flashes, the sound of the trumpets and the mountain smoking. And when they saw it, they trembled. Stirred afar off. Then they said to Moses, here's the most tragic passage in Scripture. Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Can I, can I talk for a second? That was the beginning of the man of God syndrome where I come to church to hear a preacher hear from God for me. 
because I can't hear from God for myself. They saw all the thunder and all the lightning and all that was going on, and they said, we want no part of that. Moses, you go up and you hear what that angry God has to say, and then we'll come, but you come down and tell us, Moses, we want to hear. We need a God translator because we don't want to talk to him ourselves. Fast forward four, five, six thousand 6,000 years. Now we're blocked in a place where we think the pastor is the only person that can hear from God for us. And I need to come to church to get a word from God because I haven't had a word in seven days. You didn't have a word, not because you didn't go to church. You didn't have a word because you didn't understand that he wanted to speak to you and meet with you. And he does not need a mediator. He does not need a translator. He wants to speak to you because he said, my sheep hear my voice. Can, can, can we talk about what Destiny Church is? I'm not teaching you to hear from me. I'm teaching you to hear from him. The people said we're afraid. And I can't, get too, I can't get too hard on Israel. Here's why. They had never encountered God. They had grew up in a place where there were 2,000s gods, and the ultimate God, the God of all gods, was Pharaoh, their master, their abuser the source of their problems and their death and their bondage. In all their mind, the only God they had ever known was the one that had caused all their pain. And because the only God they had known had caused all their pain, they assumed that the thunder and the lightning and all this noise that was going on was just another God that was trying to cause them the same pain. Watch this. One of the greatest attacks of the enemy is to get you to connect pain in your past to God. Because if you can connect pain in your past to God, you will think that he's an angry God and that he's an evil God and that he's a disconcerned God. So, so the reason why that sickness happened is because God didn't care. And the reason why the loved one passed away is because God didn't care. Not understanding. None of that was God. It was always the enemy manipulating your perception of God. Because if I can think that God let something happen to my family members and let that bad thing happen and he let this bankruptcy happen and he let that divorce happen. If God did this and God did that, when God beckons me near, I don't want to come because the only God I know is the one that failed me. Watch this. Are y'all having fun? Yeah. Watch this. Moses was never a slave. Moses was never a slave. So Moses never had the tragic past to skew his vision of God. So when he met God at that burning bush for the first time, he had no idea of what it was like to be under Pharaoh's tyranny or Ra or these other false gods who were distorting his view of God. So he was able to take God at face value and accept him for who he truly was. What pain in your past is distorting your view of the goodness of God? What lie of the enemy has you, have you believed that God did something wrong or he forgot about you or whatever it may be when it was never God in the first place? It was the fact that we live in a sinful and a fallen world and not only did he not cause it, but he died on the cross so that the results of it cannot carry on with you through life. Sometimes it takes somebody, you, 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 you know, you can't, you can't tell me anything. You haven't been through what I've been through. It's because I haven't been through what you've been through that my, my vision of God is not distorted in the same way. Yeah. That I'm able to say, no, he is a good God. Yeah. No, he does have a plan and a purpose for your life. No, he does love you. No, he's not just a Lord and a savior, but he wants to be a friend and a confidant. Yeah. Watch this. Because of their fear of God, before they died, they were only ever to, able to meet God as a deliverer and a provider. He delivered them out of bondage and he fed them. So their idea of God is God is a God that delivers and God is a God that provides. When you have a relationship, let's just talk. When you have a relationship with God through your pastor, you will only ever know God as a deliverer and a provider. So watch this. If there's no bondage that I need to be delivered from, I don't need God. 
If there's no lack in my life that I don't need him to provide, then I don't need God because I've only ever known God as a deliverer and a provider. And I know God delivers and I know God provides, but I just wish we could preach something else besides he provides and he delivers because he's not just a provider and he's not just a deliverer. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Rose of Sharon. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who was and is and is to come. He is at the end of a thing before the beginning of it. He's the one that knows my name. He's the one that calls me friend. He's the one that shares his desires here on earth. God says, I deliver and I provide, but that's not all I do, boo-boo. Yeah. It's not all. It's John, John 15, 15 says this, I no longer call you servants. Can I, can I just be ignorant just for a second? Yeah. God is saying, stop looking at me like that. <laughs> I'm not calling you a servant anymore. Stop being afraid of me. Because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, this is God talking to you. I have called you friends. I'm going to stop asking permission to preach and just preach. Stop praying only when you need something. That's not a friendship. That's a genie in a bottle. God bless. Who was that? Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, one of them. He said, I'm not a genie. Don't just talk to me when you need me. Boy, it's, it, life gets good when you start telling jokes with Jesus. <laughs> when you're just driving down the street in your car by yourself, you start cracking up. Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see that? So he pulls up next to you like, they are losing it. They laugh. Maybe they're on the phone or something. He said, don't just call me when you have a problem. I want to be there. I am a provider. I am a deliverer, but that's not all that I am. And Israel never got past the providing and the delivering God because they always equated God to the same fear that they equated Pharaoh. So they never went up on that mountain. Can I give you, uh, let's just, Numbers 13, 33. So they finally get to the promised land, right? They finally get to what God had for them. You finally start that business. You finally get married. You finally have that miracle baby that the doctor told you is medically impossible you'll never have. You finally get that relationship reconciled. You finally have more than enough. You're not struggling. There's not, not more month than there is paycheck. You have more. You finally get there, and this is what it says. We, we, we saw, you saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. How do you know what they thought? Did you ask them? Here's the problem. They never went up the mountain. So they never experienced the fullness of God's glory. And because they had not experienced the fullness of God's glory, giants that were made by that God intimidated them. If I don't experience the glory of God, the promise will always be intimidating because I did not experience the creator of that problem. The only reason a problem can intimidate me is when I haven't experienced the creator of the world who is not concerned about the problem because he created the problem. The problem is distorted, and if it means he created it, it means that he can fix it. If they had gone up on that mountain and they had all come down with their faces shining like they were in a Dragon Ball Z commercial, they would have looked at those giants and said, man, those giants are chum meat compared to the God that I've seen. When you finally have that child that you are believing God for, you will feel like an inadequate parent if you haven't first encountered the presence of God that's bigger than any problem you can face. When that business finally blows up, you will feel like an inadequate leader. If it's the presence of God that gives us confidence to slay giants. God's saying, without an encounter with my presence, you'll never take the promise. The last thing is this, and you write this down, his presence, his presence, his presence, his presence is life. Right before they go in, 
What's tragic is Israel that came out of Egypt is not the Israel that went into promised land. I, I, did, I did some research for this message. I, I, I put my work in. Y'all proud of me? I put my work in. I was all up in geographical books and historical books and timelines and all that other good stuff. 40 years they were in the wilderness. It took them two years to get from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And when they rejected the presence of God, they said, we don't want to go up. God said, fine, take them to the promised land. And they sat at the edge of their promise, not going in, for 38 years. They weren't wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. They were only walking for two. The last 38, they spent staring at something that God had for them, but they never could possess. Could it be that God doesn't have you in a waiting pattern? But you've decided to be stuck in that waiting pattern because you're more fixated on the promise than you're fixated on his presence. Remember last week I told you I'll give you a secret on how to accelerate that waiting season? I've learned that when my life feels stuck, it's because God is trying to reveal a part of himself to me that I have not yet known. So when I can't get a door open, I can't get anybody to answer a phone call, I can't go back, I can't go forward, you know what I start doing? I start fasting, I start reading Bible at, at, at portions that I've never read before. I get back on my piano, even though y'all kick me off the worship team, you can't stop me from playing the piano in my own house. And I get to crooning and the dog starts barking and the babies start crying and I don't care because I am pressing into the presence of God because I've learned the only reason I'm stuck is because he wants my attention. So let me let him stop fighting for my attention and let me just give him my attention freely and willingly and I've discovered the more I press in the more he reveals himself to me and gives me the confidence for whatever it is that the promise was Joshua warned the people in Deuteronomy 8 19 then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you. So you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord. It's a natural miracle that Israel, that that Middle Eastern area is prosperous. And I, you know how they say the blessings of the Lord is irrevocable. That's where all the oil is. That's where all the wealth is. Thousands of years later, because when God blesses something, it's blessed. But watch this, Israel, desert all the way on the southern and eastern portion. Treacherous mountains all the way on the north and eastern portion. And then the Mediterranean Sea to the west. It makes no godly geographical sense that that is a prosperous region of the world. What God was trying to get Israel to understand is the only reason it's prosperous is because my presence is there. There's no Nile River to explain the prosperity there. There's no natural wealth. to God says it's prosperous because I'm there. And if you get distracted from my presence, I won't be there anymore. And the second I'm not there anymore is the second that it's not prosperous anymore. You have to understand, it's my presence that sustains the promise. Your marriage is working because I'm there. It's not because you guys are soulmates. Can I preach for a second? It's not because he's the only person in the world who gets you. Nobody gets you. <laughs> it's not because you're the only person in the world that gets him. It's, it's not because you click. It's because he's in it. And he said the second I'm not in it is the second it won't work anymore. So I have to get you to understand that I am the sustainer of the promise. Your business is prosperous not because of the economy or your gifting. It's prosperous because I'm in it. 
And the second I'm not in it anymore, it won't work. God's presence to your promise is like vibranium to Wakanda. <laughs> Can I throw out a little at the movie sneak peek? No vibranium, no Wakanda. No presence, no promise. He said, it's my presence that sustains your dream. So I need, Psalm 1611 says this. You make known to me the path of life. God, it's in your presence where there's fullness of joy. Not in the dream job, not in the dream relationship, not in the dream degree. It's in your presence where I feel full. It's in your presence where I find joy. And at your right hand, the right hand, that's my left, I'm sorry, my right hand. Your right hand represents the favor of God. And God, in your favor is where there's pleasures forevermore. God says, I have a promise for you. But first, I have to get you to understand that that promise is sustained by my presence. Yeah.